The yeah. one thing that I would love access for is hot sauces. Like, <laughs> give me, let me pay five, ten dollars a month, and I just get all the hot sauce I could ever want. It'd be awesome. Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I'm your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Brian Mitchell to talk about the access economy. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED29. All right, Brian, so access economy, this is an episode that's going to kind of tie into a few other episodes that we've already done in the past okay um it it touches on a lot of the same kind of economic principles as uh the post-scarcity episode yeah. uh, which i did with uh brandon back in in august i think it was september or something like that of yeah. 2017 we're also going to see a lot of stuff since we're going to be talking about like ride sharing and things like that um it also ties into the future of transportation which was uh what was it the extra dimension number like 17 or something like that yeah. way back in the day i think i was on that one yeah it was you me and ryan yep um but so th so the access economy is basically the concept of like how do our lives change how do our attitudes change when we go from the assumption that like you you want to own everything that you use to just the assumption that like well i have access to this thing mm -hmm. whether i own it or not right um and so there's there's different like payment models that go along with that and stuff and we'll get get deeper into those but i i kind of started thinking about this topic uh <laughs> actually back when the verge had their fifth year anniversary if you'll recall i think that was i think that was a good like two years ago now yeah um and they they did a series of interviews with people uh, about like what is what are the next five years going to look like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the interviews with w was with a guy named Astro Teller who works for Google's um, X, was it the X Project or the, I, it's one of their like you know crazy labs that tries out like yeah. moonshot ideas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so one of the things that he was talking about a bunch was like since like drones were were the big hot topic at the time, right? Yeah. You know they were talking about like well. If you can come up with a system that like will use probably drones to get things to people as soon as they need them, then you don't need to own things anymore. And so he was talking specifically about like common household items, right? Like a hammer or some batteries or whatever, right? You don't need to buy yourself a hammer because when you need a hammer, like 90% of the time, you're not using a hammer, yeah. right? It's a tool that can be shared across peop yeah. multiple people. Yeah, so like when you need a hammer, you just press a button, hammer comes to you by drone, you know, in a matter of minutes, you use hammer, you hand the hammer back to the drone, and then the drone flies off, right? Yeah. And, and so he was talking, yeah, a lot about like, this way we can much more efficiently use our resources, right? We have to manufacture far fewer hammers across the entire population. We're going to have a lot less waste in the case of batteries, right? He was talking about, like, you probably have a bunch of batteries sitting in a drawer at your house that, um, you know, are, like, slowly losing their ability to hold a charge because they're just sitting there. And, yep, you know, definitely. And you don't use double A's at a high rate as we used to, right? And so I started, you know, really thinking about that concept. And I was like, well, okay, like, what else could we transfer to this new this new assumption of of access instead of ownership right i think cars is a big thing that i jump to yeah and and i think cars is a is a great example because they are their own form of transportation right and so that's why i think that that's going to be like one of the, the gateway drugs into this access paradigm for a you, lot of you people you can't really carry a car with a drone no <laughs> but the car carries itself so it doesn't yeah. need a drone exactly. yeah um Unless we start using drones as cars, in which case, you know, then like, <laughs> and then every things are going to change a lot before that happens. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine so. Now, one of the problems with choosing this as a topic for a podcast episode is when you do research on the access economy, what shows up almost exclusively is the sharing economy. 
because that's that's one of the big hot topics right now is talking about like how can we enable customers consumers to like redistribute recycle reuse all of the stuff that we own for other people um and you know and and it's true that does reduce the need for as many people to own things right because you know as long as as long as there are enough people in your area who like have cars then you don't need to own a car you can just request a lift right yeah and then get to where you're going um uber for blank yeah exactly and so the the kind of happy coincidence of the timing of this episode that we're doing is that um we live in the Twin Cities here, yes? And uh, what big event recently happened in the Twin Cities? Uh, Super Bowl. Yep. The reason that the Super Bowl timing got me excited about this ep- episode is because, of course, Airbnb has huge surge in like the number of people hosting when there yeah. are big national events like this going on that that uh, you know a town isn't used when to. When there's more demand, there's more supply. Yep. And and so like my I, initially I was planning on putting up our spare room but then as it turns out uh my family's life got kind of crazy when we had a car accident and you know then my sisters were staying with me so they were staying in the spare room and etc etc but i managed to find somebody here in uh in the saint paul minneapolis area who uh actually put up her home for the very first time uh on airbnb and uh, and so we talked a little bit about the sharing economy, um, specifically through the lens of Airbnb as kind of a case study. Yeah. Um, so here is my interview with Melody. Hello, I'm Melody. I live in Minneapolis. I am a college instructor at a community college where I teach media stuff, interestingly enough. And I also have rented out my house for Airbnb. I live in North Minneapolis. And I I found out that you were doing this specifically because the Super Bowl is happening in town and you mentioned it on your podcast. So was that like, was that the first time that you had used Air- Airbnb as a host or or had you done this before? I had never hosted before, and yes, I did mention this on my podcast, Feminist Killjoys PhD. Thank you for that plug. Uh, no, I had never hosted before. We actually had wanted to host, and like we bought this house about a year ago, and we thought, oh, we should like put this on Airbnb because we use Airbnb so much. But we didn't get like fully motivated until it was the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. because well, one thing that kept us going is I think I started to create my hosting account and I stalled on it. And then people from Airbnb literally called me and were like, do you need help finishing your thing? And so they were kind of pushing me, which I understand why, but I found that to be a very unique aspect of like setting up an account that's, they were calling me like wondering, wanting to know if I needed help. Usually there's not a human that calls you and just like, just wondering how your Twitter experience is going. If you would like (laughs) some assistance in retweeting. How does the experience of of using Airbnb from start to finish kind of give me like a summary? There is a lot of pre-work to hosting. So we had to put in a lot of time, a time investment, if you will, to ho- to like get our stuff all set up in terms of like cleaning up our house, taking pictures, you know, like making things look really nice and then posting all those pictures, creating a summary that would be enticing. We left our cats at the house. And so we had to also pitch people on our cats. And that mm. worked out well. So if anybody's interested in how that works, usually pet lovers will find you and they will have no problem <laughs> with the pets that you leave behind. And we what was interesting, though, is we put it up you know, for Super Bowl specifically, but also intending for us to re-pitch our house like on a non-Super Bowl weekend, right? So in our Super Mm -hmm. Bowl pitch, we're like, we're really close to downtown, which we are. We're like only, you know, three miles from the stadium and kind of pitching it as like being very close to those amenities. But we were also doing it knowing that like, okay, well, after this weekend's over, we're just going to like re-host it, either the full house when we're out of town or, you know, a single room that people could rent. Mm -hmm. But another aspect that we were slightly worried about is the saturation of the market during the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't know how deep you get into economics on your show, but in terms of like the sharing economy, I know they had the same problem with Lyft and Uber downtown because one of my mm-hmm. friends is a Lyft Uber driver. And the market was also saturated with new people becoming Lyft and Uber uh, drivers just for the Super Bowl weekend. Ah, yeah. And the same exact thing happened on Airbnb. And I think some of it was through Airbnb's marketing, like, as I was just telling you earlier, when they called me, you Mm -hmm. know, so they were like actively helping people in Minneapolis and St. Paul get their their houses online on their website, but I think it created a saturation. And so there were a lot of houses available and we were just, I think our location was one reason we got picked, but it was definitely not assumed that somebody would rent out our place. Right. And I, I, so obviously with like Lyft and Uber, the company determines like when the surge pricing and everything happens with airbnb is it the hosts who determine what they're asking for for the price you can either use smart pricing or you set your own price okay and the smart price is a algorithm of some sort and i'm not sure how it was determined Mm -hmm. but for example we have a house that could sleep seven people there's three separate bedrooms Uh, It's not a huge house, but there's a lot of room for human bodies. And they were telling us the smart pricing was like $141 a night. Mm -hmm. Even though the algorithm was also showing that there was a small amount of houses to rent for that weekend at that time based on demand, the smart pricing just felt really low for us. And so we set it like, you know, I think just a little bit under $400 a night just because we weren't trying to scam anybody, but it's like, okay, well, you could have like six people stay here. Like that's a really good deal for oh, yeah. a big group of guys or girls or who, you know, gals, ladies, gentlemen, all sorts of genders, whoever wants to stay at our house, you know, the deal could be like maxed out and you could get, you know, a lot of people in here for a very little bit amount of money. And we only had it set for like a one or two night minimum. I was like, ah, this is not really worth the money like to have somebody stay here for a little bit of time, not make that much more money. The minimum night stay was also really important to make it kind of worthwhile in terms of our initial of investment. Like since we had a successful rent, like the time that we spent, the cleaning we did, like it's all worth it now. Anything after mm-hmm. this is like super worth our time if we run out more in the future. But uh, that, yeah, that's how we we decided to set our own our own price. Because right. I think the other element to it is the you don't want it too low because then people wonder why it's so low. And then you don't <laughs> want it too high because they're like, your house is definitely not worth, you know, a thousand dollars a night. So right, right. we thought I actually thought through that pretty intensely. So, yeah. And I, I, I suppose the the time investment being worth it um, also depends a lot on whether you put up like the entire house and you're leaving or, or if, you know, you just put up like one room kind of thing and then you're still there. Uh, cause you know, the, just having one room would probably take a lot less prep work from you. Exactly. And we were leaving the house. So we were always going to leave the house. No, it, we're just like, well, we might as well make some money since we're leaving anyways. Mm-hmm. Right. And so getting the whole entire house ready, we wouldn't be there to like fix any things, you know, no dust could we clean up while we were gone. So right. we had to get everything pre preset. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the big like issues facing the, the sharing economy is like the question of how is everybody involved and all of like the the items involved safeguarded? Because, um, you know, you're you're inviting people into your own house. So there's a lot of risk there. But also like those people are coming into a stranger's house. So there's risk on their end as well. Um, so what kinds of like what kinds of systems do you know that um, Airbnb has in place to like deal with this kind of thing? They have verification systems, which make you feel both surveilled, but also safe, depending on what end of the deal you're on. Mm -hmm. So when I am a host, I can ask for specific verifications, like they have to supply a state ID, a scan of their state ID. I don't get it. Like, I don't receive a picture of that, but Airbnb Mm. has that housed. So then therefore, if I come home and my house is damaged, they have that verification of who the people were that stayed with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a bunch of other things that you can put in as a verification. And I can't remember 
all of them. I'm sure that I supplied my full name, maybe my, I don't want to say my social security because that seems like a little much, but I do know that I have scanned my own government ID to house with Airbnb because the more verifications you have, like the the better you are as both a host and a guest. And so mm-hmm. like when I'm searching for houses as a guest, I can see, oh, well, th- well, this host has seven verifications, meaning they've verified their identity and who they are and what they, you know, whatever else you need security wise in seven different ways. And so that just sends a message to the user that like they're, you know, safe to rent from. And there's also like the very Black Mirror-esque uh, rating system, you mm-hmm. know, and so you have like all these five stars and people have comments. And if you don't have a lot of reviews, like I was worried, well, nobody has stayed at my house before. So what kind of credibility do I have? And Airbnb actually ranks you sometimes based on that with the search function, like where you show up in the listings. And they actually incur so this is connected to the safety issue while they have all mm-hmm. those safety mechanisms in in place they really push you to do instant booking which means if i'm hosting they say turn on instant booking which means there's no conversation between you and the guest they can oh. book instantly and i was like okay oh, Okay, I, I guess I'm because they, you know how they they like just slightly encourage you to do these things. They're like, "Are you sure you don't want to have instant booking on?" And every step mm-hmm. of the way, they're like, "Are you sure? Are you sure?" It's like, "Okay, fine. I guess I'll do that." And that was kind of weird for us because I was like, "Whoa, well, I guess that John Smith is staying with us because he just booked. I hope he's cool with everything." Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, in terms of like my issues of like having the cats here, that's like my valuables, right? Right. They they have like house rules that they have to actually the user has to say okay to like if you stay in this house there will be cats here if you stay in this Mm -hmm. house there is you know no access to the basement you know and so you say your things that you want them to verify before they book but it's kind of it's two messages it's like okay we're gonna do all these safety things for you um we're gonna remind you that you have a million dollars in insurance if something happens to your stuff but mm. also, will you instant book? Can you let people instant book? You'll get booked faster. You'll you'll come up higher on the search results. So mixed messages there. But I didn't. People have asked me that before about the safety stuff, and I haven't been worried about it um, because of all the the user reviews. I guess I don't know. I just haven't felt as worried as I think some other people might be, but I also don't have a lot of nice things. <laughs> it's like, uh, my most valuable things are my cats and I take my Mac laptop with me and anything mm-hmm. else can be replaced. Like I don't have jewelry and high tech right. stuff. So if you're thinking about robbing me, it's like really not worth your time. Cause we don't. So you mentioned, you mentioned like that they have a million dollars of insurance. Is that through Airbnb? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a, that's nice. Yeah. Now, I, I think it sounds like the instant booking feature might also be uh, one of their attempts to kind of mitigate racial discrimination between like hosts and and uh, guests um, because they've, they've yeah, they've had a yeah. lot of like kind of high profile cases of, um, you know, people being rejected because they're, you know, their profile picture, they're black. Right. And um and I believe that they did some, like Airbnb, the company did some research, some field tests where they they found that like having uh, at least one review on an account in in the reputation system was like enough to to mitigate that effect with the discrimination stuff. Yeah, yeah. The you know another thing that I was talking about this morning was uh both like racial and and gender discrimination but also the ADA stuff the Americans with Disabilities Act yeah and like well the way that me and my partner were talking about it was there's no regulations right so i and right. and somebody else was giving me an example of with Lyft and Uber too there's no regulations so you can have whatever kind of car you want right so if you show up with a Dodge Ram pickup truck that's like 6 feet off the ground um oh, yeah only so many people can find that to be accessible. And so the same thing with with Airbnb is that you can 
you can say that you're ADA compliant and not be, right? Like, so versus hotels, so the old form of economy where we just like rent from these big corporations, uh, mm-hmm. there's they're ADA compliant by law. And so they have to have those rooms. And so they do have side transfer bathrooms and they do have elevators. And that's not required in people's houses. And to make a house ADA compliant, you almost have to have somebody with a a disability in that house that fully understands like all the ways that a house cannot be accessible for all sorts of different disabilities. And so that's also been in terms of like kind of who can access the sharing economy, people with especially physical disabilities have had some really hard struggles. And that is like beyond what they're talking about with racial discrimination, because that's like the how your house is built. You know, so you're not discriminating right. because you don't have a wheelchair ramp. But if we're going to move into the sharing economy where we're going to get driven by people's personal cars and stay in people's personal homes, like that feels a lot better to me than stay- staying in a big corporate hotel. But mm-hmm. like what people are left behind in that system then. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the coming up with solutions for those kinds of problems is a huge challenge because um, on the one hand, it's like in order to encourage people yeah because obviously you can't force people to own a home that is wheelchair accessible but you know is can can airbnb like encourage people to provide those kinds of things by rewarding like you know like giving you some extra dollars for having you know that kind of thing um but then it's like we want to make sure that that it, that's that that financial burden isn't on like the guest who needs these services right Right. And at this point, I feel like staying at Airbnbs are cheaper. Like you can find a much better deal than right. staying at a hotel. And it's an interesting pitch to like ask certain, maybe certain hosts that like host a lot, like they're really popular and they spend a lot mm-hmm. of time, ho- you know, renting out their place. Like we're not going to have a high frequency guest turnover at this place just because we live here. But I know there's some people that, you know, I don't even know if this is legal, but where they like rent out an apartment that they just like never live in. But if you have a freak, mm-hmm. you know, high frequency, I could totally see Airbnb saying like, hey, can we can we co-invest in this? Um, but I mean, getting a house accessible, <laughs> depending on your house can be really there's a lot of money that would go into that. Yeah. And I don't I don't really know what the workaround is for that. But right now, as it sits like they're very much relying on the host being honest about whether their house is ADA accessible, safe for children, you know, there's a couple other things that you can mark. Uh, Mm -hmm. But that is like, you just it's just self reporting. It's not regulated. Right. right. And they don't even give you like examples like for like being safe for children. Like, uh, sure. I mean, I've had a baby over here. It's safe. Like, (laughs) no, it's not like there's stairs, there's like cords everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not set up for kids, but I could click safe for children, you know? And so, you know, but I think that's one of the elements of the sharing economy is that it's all back to the actual people and communicating. But there are, I know people don't like regulations, but in the media world and the technology world, I feel like there's some regulations that are for the good, for the good of all people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you, you mentioned the kind of trend of some people just like, you know, like owning an apartment basically, and then renting it out all the time, uh, as an Airbnb. Um, do you like, from what you've seen, does it seem like that, that there's enough kind of money coming in for that kind of thing to be viable? Or is this more of like a, yeah, it's nice to have this extra income. It's a side hustle kind of level. And of course, Minneapolis is going to be different than like New York City or something like that. But Right. So, in well, yeah. And also San Francisco, I think, was the big case study in this mm, and where mm-hmm. it like really exploded. And people are like, well, there's no place to rent because these shell companies are just renting everything out for Airbnb. Mm-hmm. Is it worth? I don't think the market is strong enough here. We're not a tourist town. Right. I think if we were living in a tourist town or I was living maybe, let's say, really close to Paisley Park, where Prince Prince's old Uh, studio, where there is tourists that come all the time, 
it probably would be worth it, but there's just not enough. We don't have enough events like the Super Bowl to bring people in where there's right. other towns across the United States that they might not even be in a big town, but it just ends up being a tourist area. Like in Minnesota, going up to Duluth or the Boundary Waters, like that, those are tourist towns. Mm-hmm. So that could definitely be worth it. Well, actually, you know what? I do know of one place that I dropped my friend off at who was from out of town and he stayed in an apartment that I'm pretty certain was just flipped over for Airbnb. Hmm. But I'm guessing that it was the landlord who was doing it. Like he decided, he, they decided that, you know, I can get more money renting this out for Airbnb, maybe for parents who come stay to check on their kids at school, et cetera, et cetera than having some high, some college students rent it out and destroy it mm-hmm. because it just right. seemed too clean. It seemed too bare boned, but it was in an apartment building that like college students rented out. But then you walked in and it was like this amazing place. And so mm. I know some people do it. I just don't, I, it just doesn't seem like the market, but again, I'm not an economist or anything. I'm just, I'm just a resident of Minneapolis. Right. Yeah. The, Financial transaction is like handled entirely by Airbnb, right? So do you know like what kind of taxes are applied to Airbnb like financial transactions? Funny you should say that because I have an email that I have flagged from Airbnb saying that I need to update my tax information. (laughs) So I'm I'm I know that they collect they do collect like a fee, right? And it Mm -hmm. wasn't that big of a fee, like from I was like fine, have the $30 or whatever. I'm sure it's just a percentage of what we made. And then I probably do get taxed on it. There's no way that I don't. Because I mean, think of all the money that people make on Airbnb for that not to be taxed. Mm -hmm. Right? So I have to be paying at least, I don't know. I can tell you later after I set up my tax situation what they're getting from me. But I'd have to get taxed on it, right? Like... I would imagine so cuz it's not like it's not like you know an Amazon order where Amazon if as long as they don't have like a physical presence in the state where you're ordering it to, you know. Mm-hmm. Um you know cuz obviously you well you have a physical presence here in Minneapolis but like Airbnb probably doesn't. So that's a that's a, I, I now that I mentioned that I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I can I can look and let you know um I was just thinking about this too in terms of the sharing economy more towards funding each other so like with patreon Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. there you know i'm always curious about we don't make enough money on our podcast to it's not even a take-home income it just goes right back into the show you know Mm -hmm. but there's no tax stuff involved in that and please the federal government don't come follow me i have no money (laughs) to give you there's nothing to tax but you know people the the podcasters who make a ton of money off of that like can live off that money Mm -hmm. i mean that's got i mean they would have to say that they were an independent contractor and it was like money that they brought in. But that seems to be, again, with this regulation stuff, like for now, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. But mm-hmm. I, fe- I feel like there there might be a couple people that get, like you were saying, with the racial discrimination, like there might be a couple instances in which like the taxing system kind of comes back around. I'm really curious how the IRS is going to deal with this because the way that our economy works right now, it's like we're mm-hmm. kind of with GoFundMes for healthcare and all, it's all sad, right? That we like have to like yeah. support each other in this way, but it's not through the regular streams of income. And so I wonder how the IRS feels. I don't really care how they feel. I do like to pay taxes to support, <laughs> you know. Public public works and- Yes, but, yeah. but I've also heard that they're not the nicest people and they, you know, mm. mm-hmm. whatever. They can do their thing. It's just something I'm thinking of. But yeah, I should, uh, Airbnb just tells me that I really need to- I really need to enter in my tax stuff. And I actually haven't Mm -hmm. even looked to see if that money got put into my bank account yet. Because I'm wondering if they're holding it until I fill out this stupid tax stuff. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, that that is a good question for you to answer for yourself is, did I get paid? (laughs) Well, like, I know, like, it's all very clearly um documented with an Airbnb, so I'm not so worried Mm -hmm. about it. I have to fill out an I, I have to fill out a W-9. Yeah, so it seems, I just looked really quick, if you need to collect local, if you determine that you need to collect tax, you can add it with blah, blah, I don't know. Oh, I'm supposed to ask my guest to pay it in person? It says, if you determine that you need to collect tax, you can usually either add it 
in within a special offer or ask your guest to pay it in person. In each case, it's important that guests are informed of the exact tax amount prior to booking. Wow, that seems like a big like no no that you know most of these like sharing economy ecosystems are like n- never ever exchange money you know with each other in person. Usually they're like use our our app our system exclusively for all the financial transactions so that people like don't get extorted. So it seems like there is specific cities and states that require it. Mm, so okay. that includes like there's some places that it's so they actually put it in, they automatically collect it, Airbnb does. So in Amsterdam, Portland, and San Francisco, Airbnb automatically collects occupancy tax from guests. Okay. Speaking of money, most of these like sharing economy uh, companies try to kind of portray themselves as like, you know, we're a great community, right? And, and you know, give back to the community and kind of share with each other and stuff. But, you know, of course, then, you know, there's a lot of people who use it simply because like, oh, it's, you know, a lot cheaper than a hotel. Um, so which which of those polls do you have you seen being like more of a factor for people or for yourself? Mm, I'll speak for myself that I'd rather stay at somebody's house mm. because I don't like the starkness of hotels. I know some people like love that. Like, let's go to this fancy hotel with clean sheets and like little bottles of shampoo like that sounds really great but that for me it just doesn't feel i like cozy homey kind of places and when i travel i also like to get to know the actual city like i don't often hotels are put in places where it's like downtown it's very sterile just like not in a neighborhood and so i used to actually stay in hostels a lot before airbnb kicked in because hostels are very Mm -hmm. similar and one benefit of hostels though is that they were very cheap so if you told me that there was an Airbnb for $150 or I could stay at a hotel for 100 I might still go with the Airbnb just for like mm. the local flavor. And I would just feel more comfortable, me personally. I would assume because we live in a capitalistic society that people are doing it because it's cheaper. Because it is. Like – Right. You can't find the same deals in a hotel and the locations because all hotels are pretty much in downtown centers that if you're looking for a place closer to Paisley Park, for example, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's hotels in Minneapolis are very far away from that. But if there is a house that is available next to Paisley Park, even if it's the same price, you would rent that one out. I don't know. I think it really depends on who you ask. That would actually be a cool survey for Airbnb to Mm -hmm. do. I don't know. I don't know. But that's my experience. Yeah. And of course, I mean, if if Airbnb themselves did that kind of survey, uh, you know, they kind of have a vested interest in getting uh, one type of answer. That's a good point. Airbnb should not do that survey. Somebody else should. Yeah. Thank you. Poor research methodology that I just suggested. (laughs) Yeah. Any uh, final thoughts on on Airbnb, the sharing economy, et cetera? One thing that I think about a lot with the sharing economy is that I've really I really like it. But mm-hmm. in terms of like being both a host and a guest or like a user of Lyft or Uber, um, in terms of like the people I meet, how easy it is. Um, but I was also very, very, very resisted, resistive to Lyft and Uber when they first came out because of all the taxi drivers that were losing mm-hmm their customer base. So I feel like I'm a hesitant user of Lyft um, because I'm seeing firsthand the people that have lost their job or are now getting pushed out with more competition, mm-hmm. um, more so than Airbnb. Airbnb, I feel like there's there's a lot of great things besides the critiques that I gave earlier, but that as we go along, since we see the users seem to be in somewhat control of like how this is going to look in the future, that's a very silver lining look at this that we just need to make sure that people are able to come along and are not disenfranchised by the system and finally melody where can people find you on the internet oh i love that question uh the best place to find me on the internet is twitter you can follow my media heavy account ml oh wait it's at mlh underscore a r c c Um, I'm a media teacher, so I'm always retweeting stuff about the media and technology and stuff. So there's that. My podcast is Feminist Killjoys PhD. You can go to fkjphd.com for more information on that. All right. So 
obviously Airbnb is not the only sharing economy example that's out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the things that were talked about uh, apply to other sharing economy, you know, things as well. So like, um, we'll talk a, a lot more about um, reputation systems later on, and uh, and and how important those are for these kinds of systems to like work. Um, one thing that definitely varies a lot from like system to system is the types of like regulations that would normally be applied to those kinds of services, right? So we talked about wheelchair accessibility in, in uh, Airbnbs. Um, that kind of thing would also apply to uh, like, you know, ride sharing. Um, um, as, assuming that ride sharing services operate like taxi services, right? You know, but yeah. like, um, yeah, and that's and it's a whole complicated mess, right? Um, what kinds of taxes do you apply in this area where it's like, well, we're acting like it's just a couple of friends who are sharing a thing and then like pitching in to help cover the cost. But in reality, it's a couple of strangers, you know, and it's yeah. like services provided. So, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's 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 a real challenge knowing how we are going to move forward into this sharing economy, like without leaving behind, you know, like the tax base and the you know the fringes of society who you know like who who don't get served naturally through a you know purely capitalist marketplace right mm -hmm. um so yeah so those are some of the big challenges uh regarding the sharing economy yeah um but like i said the sharing economy is not the only thing that exists when you want to get to an access economy, right? Um, because like like Astro Teller was talking about in his interview, right? The assumption that he was making about the, the way that we were going to get to access was not through neighbors sharing their hammers with each other, but with a centralized like hub uh, you know, maybe out of like a hardware store kind of thing, right? This is probably what hardware stores would morph into in this in this scenario. Um, that services like an area, and then anybody in that area can just be like, "Oh, I need a hammer right now," right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like currently, because our technology hasn't gotten there yet, the mechanism for delivery for all of this access business is other consumers, right? And I think that it, again, like cars are a good a good case study for the way that this is going to go because like Uber is currently their entire business is like a bunch of independent drivers who go around and you know give other people rides. But Uber has been very very clear that their end game is fleets of self driven cars that will just come and pick you up and drop you off where you are and then they will immediately go and pick somebody else up you know and yeah. that and that dramatically drops the cost because you're not paying a driver yeah. because the human element in most industries in most corporations right the, the employees are their biggest cost yeah and so. that kind of makes the jump from sharing to access because mm -hmm. it's you know it's not the driver's car it's uber's car yeah. and it's so it's their sharing their their fleet with the consumer which is more access to their fleet yeah and and so like most of the writers who i've seen talking about this kind of thing are all excited about like the decentralized nature of the sharing economy and seeing that as like the future right mm -hmm. um but i i kind of feel like the like capitalist marketplace is going to kind of you know edge in there even though we haven't seen that being the like the main player in the space yet mm -hmm. i think it i think it could very well be in the future especially since you consider the fact that like competition in the marketplace encourages these corporations to try to lower their marginal costs right in order to outcompete the others in their field yeah. and and so like, even though I'm sure car manufacturers would love to continue to sell two and a half cars to every single household in America, you know, they know that, like, if any of the other car manufacturers 
jump into like the self-driven car and you know like car sharing world then they're going to be at a disadvantage the the companies that have not made that jump right yeah so it's it's this weird like there's there's market pressure to move in this direction but at the same time this is going to shrink the market yeah yeah and that's one of the things that we're going to like kind of have to come to grips with as as a society is the fact that like the simple fact that having an access economy is going to result in like gdps being far lower than they are right now because we are producing far less stuff and like i personally am all for it (laughs) i i would love to see our our economy shrink and kind of cool down and you know well i mean the the same thing too is if things are more efficient Mm mm-hmm presumably costs will go down which means people have more money to spend on other things yes so it would just be shifted maybe but at the mm-hmm. same time i feel like but at the same time people are making less money probably but at the same time, i feel like companies would be charging the same amount as they would today they'd just be making a lot they'd have a higher um margin, margin. Yeah. yeah but remember like the when we when we move into these areas where like the delivery costs are so low then it becomes very difficult to keep your margins high. And we can look at a few existing examples. Yeah, I guess it just examples. takes competition to start driving prices down. Yeah, yeah. If that happens. So let's look at some like existing examples of like sectors that are currently in a an access type situation instead of an ownership type situation. Um, and the 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 path of this has very clearly followed like when a technology comes into existence that allows the delivery costs for a particular thing to like approach near zero then we uh can start to see access type models appearing right Mm -hmm. so like software was an early one because um you know then then you know you can very quickly distribute software to everything and so and like everywhere in the world uh and so like we've we've seen kind of a a mixture of models right some software is like still in the like you have to get you've got to buy this thing in order to have a copy of it but like a lot of companies um you know have done like the adobe shift where it's like okay instead of selling you a copy of photoshop once every five years or however often you're willing to pay for it right Mm -hmm. you're going to pay us a monthly or yearly subscription to this thing right um in order for you to have access to it so technically i do not own photoshop but i have photoshop creative cloud right yeah one of my favorite examples of this would be like music streaming services right um because that's that's an example that like affects me on a day-to-day basis right and i think a lot of other people as well Let's let's kind of think about that for a moment and and consider how have your attitudes towards music changed since you started like a subscription versus back when you had to buy every single piece of music that you wanted to listen to. Um I can lis- I can listen add a lot more or the amount of new music that I listen to has gone up probably. Yeah. Um for sure. Um it's easier to get up music and add it and Mm-hmm. add it to my library but i'm also living with much higher fear of <laughs> if this service ever goes down also it's totally up to everyone if they want to remove their song or album from the service and that's yeah. happened to me before too and then i'm like well uh i can't listen to this anymore that sucks i want to i want this to be a a library that i can come back to in 50 years and be like oh remember the good old days mm-hmm. and i really can't do that now anymore and that's very fearful I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't like that at all yeah, and especially uh, in the music I example love... where, like, they don't notify you necessarily when a particular song or, you know, album or artist leaves the surface, right? They should notify you when a new album comes out. But... <laughs> they do, yeah. <laughs> I would I would love to pay for a service where it's subscription-based, but I get DRM downloads that – or DRM free downloads that I can add, you know? So you want to own things without paying to own them. Yeah, totally. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Well, you know, it'd be, you know, like a movie pass. So they basically ship everyone a a credit card uh-huh. that they pay. They lower the price to 7.99 a month today. It was 9.99 before. Um 
and you can take it to theaters and just swipe it like a credit card and you get movies. You can go to one movie a day for every day of the month mm-hmm. and subscription-based movie tickets. You definitely don't get DRM-free downloads off of that. No. That's, <laughs> you don't get ownership of the movies. That's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. But it's uh, the the cost of you know one month subscription is generally cheaper than see, buying one movie ticket individually. Right. Yep. And that's that's kind of crazy. And so like the the price diff, you know the the price per song for streaming mm-hmm. and subs- or you know uh, you know download play but DRM content that you lose access to if they decide right to stop the whole service or you stop paying. Mm-hmm. It's so cheap per unit of media that i feel like something like that could exist for per album per song however that's you know they'd be making a lot less money than they used to before all this streaming stuff happened in the first place so and that's that's kind of the trade-off right is is you know that you're going to be making less money off of each individual like transaction each individual time that somebody uses the thing right but they're, these companies are may, betting that they're going to make it up in sheer volume, right? Yeah. Um, and they totally have. You know, I am I will forever pay for Apple Music mm-hmm. until the next thing that Apple comes out and they have migration steps in process. Because right. I, I've added, you know, probably thousands of songs through Apple Music over the last few years. And I I need that. I I, I don't know what I would do if, if that <laughs> stops tomorrow. I would yeah. lose my mind. <laughs> I listen to a lot of music. Other kind of existing examples that we have today. Um, so we started off with with like digital media being the the main driver of access type you know economies um, because that's the easiest place to reduce the transportation costs. Right? Um, it, it's a pretty big shift when you go from like okay we have to ship CDs to a music store and person has to go to the music store and then come back to their house and, you know, to it goes straight from a server to your device yeah. and then you listen to it. Yeah. But yeah, for, for, for physical goods, that's going to be a much tougher shift, right? Um, because like so often when we talk about technology especially on on this network right we're talking literally about like digital technology because that's what we are really interested in yeah but yeah. there are so many other pieces of technology that are kind of like like put being put into place to revolutionize other parts of you know the economy the other parts of our lives and you know and and i just like i haven't really started digging into them you know you would expect that, you know, I would be huge into like maker spaces and stuff like that, right? Of of being able to like produce your the own your own stuff that you're going to be consuming. But like for some reason I as Ian Buck am just like not as interested in like physical things. <laughs> digital. I yeah, I don't I don't know exactly why digital media ru- like rules my life so much, but uh it does. Yeah. You're not alone. Yeah, I I know. Um, Especially not around here uh, at the Nexus. (laughs) Now let's let's kind of imagine a little bit into the future of like how how this could go. What other things could we convert into an access type economy instead of ownership? And things get start to get like really really weird when you start to think about uh, examples like okay we have um like travel accommodations obviously through airbnb but like what happens when you don't need to own or rent like a permanent space for you to live in right what happens when we live in a world where i can like wake up in whatever apartment in whatever you know room i i slept in that night go to work or whatever I do during the day, right? In whatever space, because work doesn't ha- necessarily have to s- happen in the same place, right? It could... The shared office space. It could be a shared office space, right? It could, you know, so like, we, you know, we can shift the the use of each space, each, you know, room, each building, according to what we are currently using it for, right? This, mm-hmm. this skyscraper could be used as office space, workspace during the day, and then, like, at night, we can convert it into 
sleeping area, living area, right? And so it's like, I might be in room 4B on day one, but I might be on a completely different floor. I might be on like 11 E, uh, you know, like yeah. uh, that evening. Um, and it, and like, it kind of like thinking about that kind of freaks me out a little bit at first, but it's like, why should it freak me out? Because I, I know that I have a place to sleep that evening. I know that I, you know, and I your don't commute is shorter. And yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and I also wonder if we get to a place where you don't have as much, you know, physical stuff to move around. Mm -hmm. If you just have a backpack and that's literally all you have, everything else digital, you can just, you, you know, you're going to a friend's house, you know, or wherever, wherever they are that time. So you go across the city Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, I want to stay here. And you stay in the same building there, and you work like some random other place the next day. So mm -hmm. you just don't have a commute, really. I yeah, you don't need to like buy groceries concept. with you know a, a bunch of meals in mind going you know for the upcoming week because it's like okay, it's dinner time. Like either I can just like order some pre-made food and just have it you know come to me, or if I'm somebody who really likes to make food, right, I order like the exact ingredients that I need for that meal in the exact proportions that, you know, um, so then we get into actually there's some existing examples of that, right, of like uh, Blue Apron and, and um, HelloFresh and whatever other yep. like, yeah, like meal delivery services exist. But those are still, you know, much less like on demand than the world that we're imagining. Now, I have to say, like, complete shared spaces like that that you sleep in different room every day mm -hmm. you're losing so much sense of ownership and personality mm -hmm. and i feel like that's you know an idealistic place to go to maybe right maybe, but many people probably i don't see it happening it could be it could be set maybe up in a way that we're but... like whichever room is like mine for the evening before I get there, we'll have like all of my Pink Floyd posters up on the wall or something. You know, I'm thinking of you know your typical like college dorm situation. Yeah, of, yeah. But is that like a a digital projection, or is that someone goes in there and puts your posters up? I I'm imagining that we live in a world where transportation technology is so darn good that like it's it's trivial to transport those posters to where they need to be. But you have to put them up, take them down. Sure. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I can't imagine what kind of technology would facilitate that kind of world, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of hand waving away that that aspect yeah. of it. <laughs> I don't think it's exactly drones that are going to be carrying around these posters and putting them up on walls, but you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, if we start getting into things like employment itself, right? Do I need to like? I can work when I want to, and I don't have to. And I okay, that is getting into post scarcity for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You just have to work with others for many jobs. So yes, that's very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Banking is uh, actually one that is kind of starting to be done in the sharing economy, right? We've got um, systems like uh, lenders. I forget what it's called, but it, you know, micro loans essentially from you know oh, yeah. person to person. And so I I think that 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 one is already possible with the technology that we have, obviously, and is very compelling to me as kind of a mechanism for kind of re like you know the masses reclaiming this this whole you know system where like when i bought a house i had no choice but to like over the course of 30 years i'm spending twice as much on this house as it's actually worth which is kind of ridiculous to me yeah it's very ridiculous to me but like you know what were my alternatives yeah it's I didn't have a hundred and seventy thousand dollars in my pocket. <laughs> Most people don't. No, I do. Yeah, and and I'm and I'm not going to have that much money on me uh, for a very very long time. I'm not going to wait for you know twenty years to save up that much money or whatever. That's that would that I actually it would take me a lot longer than that to save up that much money uh, with a teacher salary. You know. Yeah. Insurance is another interesting example, right? Can we like kind of distribute? the need well you know eh, i don't know insurance is already kind of there when you know you have access to it when you need it except for the fact that of course you know insurance companies will try to avoid paying out to you <laughs> if they don't you know if they yeah. think they can get away with it kind of thing were you getting to like a, a shared societal insurance that yes yes but i don't think that that's necessary in order for us to have like an access yeah. type model that's for true. It. yeah but yeah like one of one of the big 
themes that I saw uh, as I was as I was researching this is most of these like kind of sharing economy type things, but also like areas where we can kind of produce like for example producing energy locally at you know on solar panels or whatever on mm -hmm. our homes right yep. and then like not having to sell that directly to the central grid and then have that be redistributed you know having systems in place where neighbors can sell like energy directly to each other or whatever in order to avoid having to like interact with the main grid at all you know, those kinds of situations would benefit a lot from being organized into like co-ops and stuff like that, right? Which is a, a model that we already have in place and, you know, people kind of understand and you know, we've, we've figured out how those work, right? Mm -hmm. So. Another interesting thing that's going to be affected by this is advertising, right? And marketing because... For one thing, people have less like identity affinity to the brands that they're using versus the brands that they own, right? You know, if, if I know that I'm going to buy a product and I'm going to have to live with that choice for the like lifetime of the product, then I'm going to be much more invested in the choice of like which brand I'm getting it yeah. from. Unless you want to pay more to replace it. Exactly. Prematurely. Yep, yep. And uh, and so, you know, in, a, in an access type situation where you don't have to use the same thing every single day, then you can try out a lot more, of, you know, many more different products, many more different brands. Um, and I, you know, like how, how do you advertise to a population who aren't buying things? Right, the the relationships are totally different in that case. Well, I feel like at that point you you advertise unique features, unique offerings mm -hmm. within within your service. So for the I, yeah the music I, streaming, I, example, I feel like services are going to be much larger than individual products, right? In terms of the yeah. marketing potential. So you know, say Procter and Gamble creates a service for all their cleaning goods, right? Mm -hmm. You'll get all those brands for who knows x amount per month or year. Or whatever you want the unit to be yeah but if they have some unique product like if you want to go eating tide pods you can do that through their service but you can't through other services mm -hmm. so they can advertise their special product that they maybe they've patent patented or something that no one else has yet mm -hmm. or otherwise you try to lock them in with extra perks so like music streaming if you have a ton of podcast or wow uh playlists or something <laughs> in a certain music streaming service you can't easily export and import those to other services right because they're probably not going to make it easy to switch they make it might make it easy to switch to theirs but not to move off of yours yeah or their own platform yeah, 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 yeah. so you're kind of locked in for convenience sake there are of course uh a few issues let's delve into that with uh with our our like access world one thing is that uh so even though we can like try out a whole bunch of different you know like products before you know settling on one that we really like on the flip side is because people don't feel the same like kind of they don't feel as much responsibility to a thing when they're using it then they won't treat it as well as if they owned it right yeah and i don't really know how to mitigate that necessarily aside from like having enough of a consequence to to you know like abusing a t you know an object <laughs> yeah but i mean at the same time like look at public transportation mm -hmm. and private cars some people's cars look worse than a bus that's true that's very true but on the other side most buses are probably a little worse than most people's cars yeah inside cleanliness things at the same time buses are probably in service more than a person would own a car Mm -hmm. you know, multiple people might own that car, which would collectively be longer than the bus, but not always, but a lot more people use that bus. So the scale is sure. way different in many cases, too. Yeah. yeah. Just more people using it. Yeah. There's a disassociation with ownership, but also just, you know, everyone's going to use it a little differently. And so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like this is just kind of a like the commons model, the co-op model, right? We just need to kind of set that up the right way 
to encourage people to treat everything well and you know because what goes around comes around when you're in this kind of uh yeah kind of world we are likely to see a shift away from locally owned businesses to large remote tech companies that's especially true in this sharing economy right where these tech companies are the ones who have to connect people to each other in order for the sharing to happen right and so then these tech companies of course keep their their margins very low in terms of like how much of that transaction they are taking off the top but it is there right and you know over the course of this huge scale that they're setting up they they you know make a bit of money at the expense of like local businesses that would yeah. otherwise be providing those services yeah you just can't compete with the the big national brand that mm -hmm. has the resources to do it super efficiently and low margins yeah yeah I mean, I guess on the flip side, even though we are shifting away from locally owned businesses, it is still local people who are providing the service in the case of a shared sharing economy, right? Um, but that's not true in the case of like, you know, these hubs that send out objects and, and things, you know, to, to all the houses in the area via drones or whatever. Because like the player in that kind of space that I can imagine would be Amazon. And they're the only ones that I can really imagine like rolling this kind of thing out anytime soon, right? Yeah. Now, one thing I'm thinking of for away from locals. So, you know, the CSA model for vegetables and produce. So CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. And um, it works on the, the principle that you have a farm that grows food, you know, within, I don't know, 50 miles of the a metro area. So there's a lot of it around the Twin Cities here. Mm-hmm. And so you, you pay in and you get a, a box of produce, fresh produce delivered every week that's from somewhere local. And so I think that there can be a draw for that, um, mm -hmm. for things that expire, go bad, or need more preservatives. You know, I think f food is a big, is like the industry for something local. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you're really thinking about carbon footprints and things. But then national brands could, you know, they could source things locally and, and mm -hmm. keep smaller distributions but then you also have and... things that are like foods that can't be grown locally, you know? Yep. So it's it's not good for everything and that'd be more seasonal. Yeah. But it's kind of how things work today too. Yeah. And actually that is oh, that is one thing that I think the access economy would not help us with very much is the fact that like in order for, for people to, you know, have access to strawberries whenever the heck they want them, right? then we definitely have to have like a global supply chain kind of thing. So, you know, because we grow them where they are in season and, and it's, and, you know, the quality will go up and down over the year and it'll be a yep. lot more expensive for certain areas of the world mm -hmm. sometimes of the year than it will for others. And it like environmentally, it'll be a lot more expensive, oh, right? Huge, and, huge difference. And that is the, and that is actually the world that we live in right now is, yep. you know, we, we've set up these farming chains where, you know, we, we can have strawberries whenever the heck we want to essentially, but uh you know at at what cost right so that one kind of yeah goes the opposite direction than most of these other things that we've been thinking about where our use of them becomes more efficient as we just have access to them instead of ownership except for the you know the case of like foods that cannot be grown locally mm -hmm. yeah and yeah like in order for that kind of thing to work i feel like you know where where we have all of these many different contracts you know coming in for different people and and whatnot we would need to be able to track all of that in order for the government to be able to like automatically, you know, assign taxes to people and stuff like that. And, and in that case we deal with like, have a lot of privacy concerns. Um, and we actually have a lot of privacy concerns in a lot of other cases in, in this access economy as well. You know, like, um, you know, like people knowing exactly when I need a hammer, right? okay, take hammer and replace it with something a little bit more interesting. Like, you know, oh, here's how many condoms Ian is like ordering yeah. per month, yeah. right? You know, something like that. And like, and actually some of the books that I was reading made the interesting point that like, well, privacy is actually a fairly new concept anyway. So like, why do we feel like we have a right to privacy, you know? And I don't know if that's a good argument or not, right? Because like, just because things used to be a certain way doesn't mean that that's how, you know, that's how we should want it to be. But, you know. What, you used to be more private, you mean? or It used to be less private, you know, because if you go back far enough and you think about, you know, bands of people, 
living together, small groups, you know, hunter gatherers, right? There, there was no privacy between any of them. But at that time, your personality and your life was expressed verbally mm-hmm. and held in people's memories. And now it's digitally archived online. Yeah. And people can go pick up things that used to not matter, mm-hmm. but now they do because they're stored somewhere. Yeah. So I think it's with our digitalization of our society, it's becoming more um, things that, you know, were small and, and, you know, everything is stored now. And that's the thing. It didn't used to be. Yeah. Everything was stored and everything wasn't so easy to, to get. It's so easy to look up something you did eight years ago on the Internet mm-hmm. when you're in high school. Mm-hmm. And for most of humanity, that would be long forgotten. Not right. Just, right. Not accessible if i didn't have uh you know a perfect archive of all of the uh instant messages that i sent when i was in high school i wouldn't know how much of a piece of crap i was back then (laughs) yep yeah yeah so yeah so i mean privacy is one area that we will kind of have to come to terms with with what we want for that right and so that's that's definitely a, a public debate that we'll have i think uh on you know what 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 are the best practices? Yeah. Speaking of returning to the way that things used to be, the social commons is uh, a, a phrase that pops up a lot when you're talking about this kind of like uh, access economy. And, and the idea is that the social commons kind of predates the capitalist systems that we currently use. And like enabling people to kind of peer to peer trade with each other without having to you know interface with this like you know broader ecosystem enables us to kind of create these commons where everybody has access to these things and so you're thinking like the old the old village in the medieval era exactly yeah and obviously neither of us are like you know, historians, experts on the the economic principles of, of <laughs> medieval Europe. Nope, not at all. But uh, but you know, it's it's that's that's the kind of thing that it evokes. Yeah, and so this comes into like reputation and trust is very important in those systems as well. And that's one of the reasons that like these reputation systems are being built into all of these sharing economy apps is because like trust breaks down in, when you have a system that like causes people to have just one or two encounters with each other right and then they're probably never going to encounter each other again um or if people are like it's too anonymous anonymous yeah because in those cases it is more advantageous to you to be a piece of crap right to try to screw other people over whereas you win yeah exactly and then and then you don't have to deal with the consequences and and but but you know if we if we build up systems where you are likely to encounter those people again then people are encouraged by the system to be nice to each other right and so that builds yeah. up trust or you need a, a score a rating that's always above your head and exactly you downvote people yep 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 <laughs> black mirror yeah <laughs> and so I thought of I thought of an explorable explanation that I played a little while ago when I was when I was thinking about all these uh, reputation systems because uh yeah explorable explanations are are really really great at uh explaining like uh, and allowing the the person who's uh like researching this to kind of play around with these kinds of systems and see how uh you know things like interact in in different cases um so i definitely encourage everybody to go and uh visit the uh the trust explorable explanation that is linked to in the uh, in the show notes here to just kind of you know play around with that and see why the social internet is uh, such a tough place to you know exist right now. <laughs> yeah. Finally, reducing marginal costs. It's uh, it's it's a it's a weird thing that is encouraged by the capitalist market that we use, but it's also what might undermine the capitalist market right because it it we're we're approaching the point where so many things are going to be their marginal costs are going to be near zero that like people aren't going to be making money in the traditional ways that they used to and so like what 
what happens then, you know, when our economy kind of slows down enough? Like who like I don't feel like we're ever gonna get to a point where the marginal cost is so low. I think, you know, there's always gonna be a cost for something. I think the biggest thing will be reduction in in labor. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, automating all this is quite expensive too. Right. And I at think, least the upfront cost is. Yeah, but if you can invest in something that is twenty percent faster, it you know, you're gonna you're gonna do it. So you can compete and further Yeah. I think yep, 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 yep. I think costs aren't gonna go down tremendously it's just going to be spent in different ways to maybe you know if you can automate for the same price as a human would do it today but at you know twice the accuracy you're going to do it that way and definitely that's, and that's why you're going to do it not just to reduce cost at mm -hmm. the same level of accuracy if that was 50 percent cheaper i mean maybe you do that but yeah i think you know and then you're not going to reduce your price by 50 percent. you're gonna you're gonna reduce it by 20%, 10%, mm. you know? Right, to keep your own. Yeah, but like, what about... Because you can't. What about your competitor who does reduce their price by, you know, 30%? And then yeah. you've got to reduce your price and that by 40%. Might, and that might, yeah, that might go together. But then you're going to be, yeah, that's true. And then you're, but then you're going to be competing for cost, not necessarily for quality, which I guess that's capitalism. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I <laughs> yeah. Mm. And Brandon and I explored a lot more about, like, what the heck happens when we take this to the extreme where like it, it's no longer cost effective for any humans to be doing any of this work uh and so that was the post scarcity episode last, yeah. from last fall yeah this topic excites me a lot because it's something that i can start applying in my own life right i can start looking for places where instead of like owning something i can just like you know, have access to it. Um, and so it, it almost becomes like a fun puzzle in my mind of, you know, finding ways to kind of use this type of system. I started off with like deciding a couple of years ago that like, well, I'm never going to own a car. Right. And from there it's like, well, where, you know, where else can we take this? What else can I, can yeah. I treat this way? Never own a bike, just use a shared bike. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's <laughs> actually that brings up something. The cost isn't there yet, though. You know, the, the co so the cost isn't there yet, but also I'm a snob, right, Brian? So like the the bikes that are available through bike sharing services are probably not going to be good enough for me because I have high taste in bikes, and and so that's where it starts to I think break down is for the enthusiast crowd, right? Enthusi yeah. like. Like car enthusiasts, that's this is one of the things that they always talk about is like, well, we're never going to have just like, you know, the like people are always going to own cars because like the thrill of driving and, you know, the like you got to like own your own car because and, it, but and also if most um, of the rest of us don't view it that way. Right. We're just like, all right, I'm going to use my my car from to get from point A to point B. Also, if your own car is faster than a shared one or um, mm -hmm. I know with a lot of um, national health care plans, they're. Some some countries that you have private hospitals and things, mm -hmm. you might get better treatment, faster treatment. It might cost you, but it's it's might be a better option. And then you right. and then things start breaking down when the those who have the means to not use it stop putting their money into it, and then it mm -hmm. and then it starts to becoming more run down. And right, I'm thinking you know like infrastructure based things like healthcare yeah. and schools and roads and you know it's all applies for the, that. the things that we've mostly figured out uh have to kind of be subsidized or or entirely run government wise yep. right yeah that the uh that the market economy will not support adequately yeah yep. but yeah like for example i can't ever imagine you know doing like an access type model for a smartphone but i suspect that that's Probably be because I'm a smartphone enthusiast, right? Well, there are access type, aren't there? You pay per month for a year, then you turn it in. Keep paying that per month, you get a new one. That's very true. And in. and I'm always telling people, like, don't buy your phone through your carrier because they screw you over, you know? They, they... But if you want a new one every year, it's a way better deal to do that if you're not attached to the device after That's that year. That's true. That's true. And And I did just buy a phone that I, like, when I bought it, the thing that I said about it is this had better last me for three or more years, right? I definitely am not following the access model there. <laughs> yeah. I am, I am very, very strongly in the uh, in the ownership model when it comes to my phone at the at least. 
I just like having my old phone to look at for nostalgia later. It's probably not worth the extra <laughs> hundreds I spend on my phone in, in there because of that. But yeah. I mean, on the other hand, I don't think that having an access model for phones where you get a brand new one like every year or every two years is the best use of our resources, right? But the thing is, after that phone gets turned back, someone else can use it who who wants to buy a yeah. used phone for cheaper. That's true. You it's, know what? It's, Actually, it's better than it's sitting in a drawer of my house not being used. Now that I think about it, Razer did have a concept computer that they brought to CES like three years ago or something like that. And it was it was designed to be entirely modular where they have just like a spine, right, that you plug in these components and unplug them. And all of the plugs were exactly the same um, because inside these like sealed containers are the individual components, right? The the processor, the um, graphics card, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so what you do is you subscribe to a particular tier from Razer and you say like, all right, I want the highest tier. I want to have the most powerful graphics card, the most powerful processor at any given time, right? And so next year when Intel, when Nvidia come out with their next versions, right? Razer sends me a new one. I unplug my old one, plug in the new one, send back the old one. Mm. And then they take that old one and bump that down to somebody who's in tier B, right? Yeah. Who is saying, I want to have the next best thing at any given time. Mm. And so that I think that would be exactly the model that we were just describing. Yeah. Now, now Razer, of course, did not actually bring that to market, but that was like the concept that they were showing off at CES. Yeah. And like modular computers and phones like that too, I feel the idea is good, but I don't think it's really sustainable too because that main shell needs to be there for like 15 years. Yeah. yeah and yeah. that I don't think will ever happen because it, it, it locks so much in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the components can be better, but your form factor is the same for 15 or 20 years. Yeah. If it's going to be worthwhile, you need, to, you need to get through it for, you know, three or four generations of computers. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not, but... You'd have to make th sure that, like, the data throughput and everything is, like, so darn yeah. high that you're like, never going to... Why would someone buy a modular computer that they're going to use for eight years if they can buy a non-modular one that'll last just as long for maybe cheaper in the long run? I don't mm -hmm. know. Because there's going to be an overhead of it being modular. Over, not... Yeah. And, I mean, even, like, the um, the classic desktop is modular, right? I can take out my graphics card and put it in a new one, right? But at the same time, it's like, well, I can't just like take out the processor and put in the brand new processor that just came out because my motherboard is too old. It uses a different socket type, right? Yeah. So it's not a hundred percent like like you said. They the interfaces do change over time. As you know, I I my current computer has DDR3 RAM in it, so I I couldn't just buy like the latest DDR4 RAM and stick it in. Yeah. So do you think, I mean, are you excited for uh, an access type economy? It probably depends on which things we're talking about, right? Yeah, and it depends if everything is access type and I and not, you know, if the prices are high enough that you can't afford everything, then that's going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, um, I don't know, a year ago, the App Store said they're going subscriptions and everyone was thinking... Oh my God, is every app going to go subscription only a dollar a month for all your apps you want to use? That's not sustainable long term because like what if someone who uses a ton of apps suddenly starts paying a hundred dollars a month to use all the apps they want? Or, you know, if apps aren't a dollar, you know, if they're, some are five, some are 20, mm -hmm. if you're doing creative stuff or whatnot, you know, you don't want to pay $200 a month for using apps all the time. That's not really sustainable long term. Right. And so in some ways you're limiting it where you could buy something used or take it off a friend who doesn't want it anymore and is going to give something to you. Yeah. The yeah. one thing that I would love access for is hot sauces. Like, <laughs> give me, let me pay five, ten dollars a month and I just get all the hot sauce I could ever want. It'd be awesome. Now, there are services out there. You pay like five bucks a month and you get a new thing of hot sauce every month. Uh -huh. They just keep sending you them. And I'm like considering doing that. That's not quite access though as, as a subscription based yes. physical good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you can't just snap your fingers and have hot sauce whenever you want. No. I did for a while consider like just having ranch with me everywhere I went, but then I realized that ranch needs to be refrigerated. Yeah. 
I think some hot sauces do. I don't know. Yeah. But. It's <laughs> Uh, and with that, on that note, I think that's my favorite thing that, that has been said so far this entire <laughs> episode. Brian, where can f- people find you on the internet? You can find me just about any- anywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Brian Mitch L uh, or my website, brianm.me. And I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck or uh, take a look at my website, ianrbuck.com to see links to other stuff that I make. This has been a production of The Extra Dimension from The Nexus TV. You can find us on Twitter uh, at The Nexus TV or send us an email at TV at gmail.com. We love to hear feedback from you guys, uh, especially since The Extra Dimension is uh, our show where we change the topic every single month. So if you've got suggestions for new topics that we can uh, cover, hit us up. Yeah, and if you'd like to learn more about what we were discussing this episode, uh, check us out. Uh, we have show notes at thenexus.tv slash TED29. Mm-hmm. And remember, this show is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. So if you want to use any part of it, feel free to do that as long as you link back to the original page. Have a good one, everybody. Watch out for cars. <laughs> <laughs>